HIV infection. How epidemiology and prevention in young women can achieve an AIDS-free generation. Karaisha Abdul Karim, Capriza, Durban. On the 9th of November 1989, I was in Durban planning the first population-based survey that would lay the foundation for research that still continues. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real privilege and honor to be here in Berlin celebrating the falling wall, but also to have the opportunity to talk to you about breaking new walls, in this case, breaking the wall of infection in young women uh, around the globe, but particularly in Africa. I want to start by um, giving you a quick overview about what is happening globally, because HIV infection is not something we find simply in Africa or in poor communities. This is a global phenomenon. In 2015, we had 36.7 million people living with HIV. Despite antiretroviral treatments that has changed the face of AIDS from something that's inevitably fatal to one that is chronic and manageable, we still continue to see 1.1 million people dying from AIDS. Of greatest concern is that we continue to see 2.1 million new infections taking place, translating to just over 5,500 infections each day. 70% of the people living with HIV are in Africa. Through advocacy, signs and investments like the Global Fund for AIDS, treat, for AIDS, TB and Malaria and the PEFA program, we've made remarkable progress on treatment. Indeed, we are starting to exceed our target set for how many people get initiated on treatment. However, we are lagging, lagging desperately behind in terms of preventing new HIV infections. We cannot treat our way out of the epidemics, and particularly sexual transmission of HIV has remained one of our biggest challenges. Between 2013 and 2015, we've seen zero reduction in new infection. I'm going to turn now to Africa, and particularly to South Africa, where I come from. And just to contextualize South Africa in the global epidemic, we have less than 1% of the global population, but we're home to 19% of all HIV infections. So this is very much a local problem for me, and particularly we see, what we see in Africa is a diversity, in fact, in the world, a diversity of epidemics within and between countries. I used the opportunity in 1990 to undertake a population-based survey uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. This was piggybacked onto the malaria control program, and we were able to get blood specimens from people from birth all the way to old age across the life course. I further disaggregated this data, and the red lines that you see in the diagram is infection in women, and the blue is infection in men. And what we see here is up to age 10 to 14, HIV infection is rare in both boys and girls. When we get to age 15 to 19, HIV remains rare in boys. And we start to see HIV infection in young men by age 20 to 24, peaking around age 25 to 29. In contrast, if we look at HIV infection in young women 15 to 19 years, already the prevalence was in excess of 6%, and we continue to see HIV infection in women across the life course. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where are these young girls getting infected from. And it is this age-sex difference in HIV acquisition that continues to drive this epidemic despite a high prevalence. If men 25 and above were having sex with women 25 and above, we would see an end to this epidemic. 
But as long as we have these two different cohorts of young women under the age of 25 having sex with men older, we will continue to see infections, continue, uh, HIV continuing to spread. This age sex difference is not unique to South Africa. In fact, as we move from Central, Eastern, or West Africa, we see the similar age sex difference in terms of HIV acquisition. Indeed, if we look across Africa and we focus on 15 to 25 year old women, they have up to eight times more infection compared to their male peers. Now we're going to move on to, back to KwaZulu-Natal and we are continue to monitor the evolving HIV epidemic. And what we see from a school-based survey that, I did in tw that our team did in 2010 is that HIV infection remains rare in young boys. So this is kids second and third year into high school. In contrast, by age 15, we already see a prevalence of 2.6% in kids in school, in high school, in second and third year. And that doubles with every two years of advancing age to where by age 20, one in four is infected with HIV. So this gives you some indication of what a high priority it is to prevent HIV infection in women. If we focus now, one of the ways that HIV sp is spread is through unprotected sex. With unprotected sex, you have pregnancy and you can get HIV. So this is a survey uh, done annually amongst pregnant women in the seven primary health care clinics in this rural district, which is one of the highest burden districts in South Africa. By age 16, one in 10 is infected with HIV. By age 18, it's one in five. By age 20, it's one in three. And by age 24, it's every other woman. So when you think about this, these are, in Africa, it's the only continent in the world where more than 60% of the people are under the age of 30. So when we have this rates of pregnancy and HIV infection, we're talking about cutting short the lives of women even before they've reached adulthood. These are our future teachers. These are our nurses, these are the carers, these are the people who bring social cohesion to society, these are our scientists, these are our leaders. And so I hope by now you are convinced as I am that breaking the wall of high rates of HIV infection in young women is absolutely essential. Not only is it essential for young women, but it's also essential to end AIDS. Now when we look at, here's the problem, young women bearing a disproportionate burden of infection, and we look at what is available to prevent infection. Abstinence, behavior change, male and female condoms, medical male circumcision. Well, for those women who have to survive because their parents have died, they're in poverty, any number of reasons for becoming sexually active, and those who do not have the ability to negotiate these safer sex practices with their partner, whether it's voluntary sex or involuntary, coerced, gender-based violence is common, what do you have to offer them? Nothing. So this is why our team started to focus on women-initiated technologies. And in 1993, we did one of the first studies to test a product to see if women use this, can it prevent that? Because we really need women-initiated technologies. And from there, we tried multiple products, and year after year after year, for nearly 11 years of trying, we became quite good experts at failing. But we learned a lot from each failure. And eventually, as we failed, we were reminded of the words of Nelson Mandela that it always seems impossible until it is done. In 2004, we said, this just can't go on anymore. So we had the idea from providing antiretroviral treatment to AIDS patients and seeing the benefit of antiretrovirals, 
and learning how we have virtually eradicated mother-to-child transmission through use of antiretrovirals, let us try and put a drug called tenofovir into a gel. And so this is what we did. We had a lot of experience in using gels. So this, we put antiretroviral tenofovir into it, and we decided to test if you put this into the general tract of uninfected women, what can we prevent HIV infection? So this was the CAPRISA 004 trial that demonstrated for the first time that antiretrovirals used by uninfected people can prevent HIV infection. The tenofovir gel in women overall resulted in a 39% reduction in HIV infection, 54% in women who were very adherent to gel use, and 74% where the high tenofovir drug levels were measurable in the genital tract. Now, we had a bonus finding in this particular study in that we also established that tenofovir prevented herpes simplex virus 2. And HSV2 is one of the most common sexually transmitted infections, and we were for the first time able to show a 51% reduction in HSV2 incidence with the same product. These results were presented at the International AIDS Conference in Vienna and simultaneously published in the journal Science. And it really marked a new era and optimism in HIV prevention. It was voted as one of the top papers in the journal Lancet and one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs in science in that year. Some indication of its impact can be viewed by the New York Times headlines as with other papers. So there were many other studies that followed. And in 2015, the World Health Organization released in their latest guidelines uh, the inclusion of daily use of tenofovir-containing agents as prophylaxis as part of combination prevention. So you would think, well, that's the end of the story. Again, let me take you to Madiba, who says, after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. And I want to give you some indication of the challenges that we face in preventing HIV infection in young women. So there were two other confirmatory trials that were undertaken uh, after CAPRISA 04 using the gel. This was the VOICE trial that demonstrated 15% efficacy and the FAX001 trial that showed zero impact of tenofovir gel. So we did a subgroup analysis, a case control analysis, and what we found is in those users in these three trials, high users of the product we were able to show very similar levels of protection. So antiretrovirals are very anti-HIV specific, but they need to be used to be effective. And a challenge we're seeing is that women were not always able to be adherent. So where we've moved on to now, ourselves in the field, is to look at products that are less user dependent. And these include two monthly injections of antiretrovirals, subdermal implants containing antiretrovirals, continue with our efforts to develop a vaccine, and if time allows, I will talk a little bit more about broadly neutralizing antibodies, and specifically CAPRISA 256. And this is where our team's effort is focused now, is on developing long-acting prophylaxis to overcome adherence problems. And we hope with our collective efforts, again, with advocacy, with good signs, with donor investments, that we can individually and collectively change the picture, and that, we should not, that when we meet not too far from now, that HIV prevention in women would be something that would be relegated to the relics of the past in museums, not to be forgotten, but that it would be something that no longer poses a threat to us. I thank you very much for your attention. I, um